is one of our clinical faculty um, uh, who uh, is in geriatric department. His main interest is in um, looking at uh, outcomes of uh, uh, patients with geriatric illnesses and influenza. He has a number of honors and awards, including an NIH-sponsored geriatric leadership award, as well as a development award. He's also received the Clinical Investigator Award um, and investigating on biodiversity and those with influenza vaccine in the elderly. Dr. Gravenstein is one that is also our own funded, does uh, research with regards to this in influenza and uh, the elderly. He has multiple peer-reviewed clinical papers and has been invited to give multiple talks all over the country in the areas of the aging patient and cognitive dysfunction. Dr. Gravenstein belongs to a number of scientific societies and is an active member of the AMA, ACP, and the Northern Geographic Society. And so without further ado, Dr. Dr. I'm going to introduce Dr. Gravenstein. He's going to give a talk on when is it okay to forget um, office and inpatient screening for dementia and the elderly. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, you know, this is now, uh, we can decide that all the people who are showing up late, for them it's okay to forget. Um, so the disclosures are, I have uh, um, support from all sorts of places, uh, including pharma, and I don't think I'll be talking much about pharma things, because support will likely be irrelevant. Um, what we're going to talk about is, uh, when should you be suspicious about cognitive and uh, the clues to look for, uh, how you screen for them efficiently and inefficiently, and, um, and what your options are, you know, so in the long term and in the near term for, for stalling progression and planning for the future. So as you, as you think about this, it's not just a question about how do we see the patient in front of us as an inpatient or as an outpatient, but, uh, you know, does it even matter? Uh, a lot of us, um, a lot of, uh, our peers are somewhat nihilistic about how we think about what we can do and what our options are. And I would say that uh, the options are continually expanding. And it turns out things where we thought we had, could have no impact, in fact, we can have an impact, and it doesn't have to be pharmacologically mediated. So uh, sort of a, a perspective from a geriatrician seat is uh, something that uh, John Bentley said, which was young people have their hopes and dreams, old people have their memories. One of the things that changes folks in their perspective in life is uh, changing from hopes to memories as to how they mark uh, their own lives in the context of the world. And then when it becomes about memories, when you start talking about your wounds and things, uh, it is also when you start taking on an, an aged phenotype. So here's the pretest. Uh, dementia is an inevitable consequence of aging. True or false? False. Dementia is common in late life. A third or more of those over 85 will have dementia. Not as confident there. So yes, that's true. Uh, one simple screening test is sensitive and specific for dementia. Right, it takes more than a screening test. Uh, abnormal clock drawing has some specificity for unsafe driving. Okay, you'll discover it's true. Okay. Next one is... Walking with talking can identify cognitive problems. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell you about that. That's actually new science. This turns out to be true, and it's something you can think about what you do when you talk on the cell phone. Um, good food choices and exercise impact dementia risk. That's true. Okay? So let's... So I'm going to talk about uh, Ma Pompo. You'll hear me talking about Ma Pompo in other lectures. If you attended my influenza grand rounds last uh, uh, spring, uh, you will uh, recognize her. In, she is one of those uh, uh, individuals that I got to meet who was really formative in some of the ways that I think about old people and what happens. And then we'll talk a little bit about the normal aging brain, so what happens just to all of us no matter what. And then uh, we'll, we'll go through some screening and some tests, which you get to participate in, to look at those. And then clock drawing tests specifically, and then what we can do. So here is this. I lock myself out of the car. Is this normal? Now, um, I ran a memory clinic for a couple of decades. And in that memory clinic, this was a common kind of complaint that I would get. And I can tell you it's not sensitive or specific for cognitive loss. 
because probably all of us have done something like that, our house or our car, and we all have memory lapses, and it usually happens because as we become adults, we start doing pattern recognition for the way we carry ourselves through the day. Pattern recognition means uh, when you get up in the morning, think about what you do. You go to the bathroom, you wash your hands, you brush your teeth, uh, you shave or do your hair, or whatever it is, take a shower. Whatever that sequence is, for yourself, it's probably roughly the same thing every day. And um, when we make mistakes, like locking our keys in the car, we have some routine about how we get into the car and how we put our bags in or whatever it is. If there's an interruption of that routine, then suddenly the keys end up being someplace where you didn't expect them, like in the car or in the house. And it's the interruption of those routines that uh, get us into trouble and, and cause these, what we would call, cognitive lapses. Now, I would tell you that uh, this is normal. We normally get interrupted in our routines. It doesn't have to be a page. It can be anything else. It can be somebody trying to talk to you or something like this. And our brains do this pattern kind of approach because it's much more efficient if you can do things on autopilot, like getting up in the morning and getting ready for work, than having to think through each step as you have to do it. In fact, it allows you to start thinking about what's happening in your day, what else is going on, what your appointments are, where you go in, what's going on with the patient, if your brain can be on autopilot as you're doing the other stuff. So the autopilot is what puts you at risk for having these little lapses like parking your keys in the car, so by itself it means nothing. On the other hand, if you didn't usually lock your keys in the car, and now you're doing it you know, once a week or so, and that's not your normal pattern, that is a little bit more ominous or that there's something else going on. Not necessarily ominous that you have a fatal disease, because it could be something like depression or something else, but recognizing that it's no longer normal. So, who is Ma Pampo? This is a picture of Ma Pampo, and she is a Dominican who lived uh, to be about 128 years according to some accounts. She didn't make the Guinness Book of World Records because the, uh, there was a church fire that when they doused it, learned of the decade in which she was born, so she might have only made it to 118. Uh, she was married in the late 1890s, uh, so that was, would have been um, in her teens or in her 20s, and she was literally 37 with a spouse in his 60s, and when I got to meet her back around uh, 2001, um, she uh, was still cognitively quite intact. I was impressed with uh, the things that she was able to relate to me just in the way that she behaved. So Dominica is not the Dominican Republic. You can see it's an island that's a little further south here, southeast. This is a mountainous island. Uh, it is not particularly great for farming. There's mangoes and things falling out of the trees as you drive down the road. Uh, uh, Ma Pampo lived there her whole life. Uh, she lived with several other seminarians that were not more than a few hundred yards from where she lived that made it to uh, her closest neighbor was 118 when I saw her at, at supposedly 128. There was a gentleman who was just one door down who was 108 years old. So they had the highest density of centenarians in the world on this island. Now the island is also interesting in part because in this high density of centenarians, um, they, uh, they had a rough life. You know, they, uh, you know uh, we, when we asked her questions, there's Ma Pampo and Mo Boaz, uh, who was an anthropologist and uh, medical school teacher there. Uh, uh, we were visiting with a, with a group of other gerontologists, including some nutritionists. One is a woman from Stanford in her 50s who was looking to Ma Pampo for the secret of successful aging, aging without cognitive loss. And so she was asking Ma Pampo, so, so, what, you know, so what is your favorite food? You know, what's the stuff you really like? And her response was, fast food. And you know, you, if you step outside of her shack and look down the street in either direction, there isn't anything close to any place to eat uh, nearby. Um, so uh, she said, what, what do you need? And she says, well, you know, it's really fast. It's hard for me to catch. It's, you know, little, she's talking about rats. And, and so, the, so she was a, essentially a, an obligate vegetarian uh, because of where she lived, even though she liked meat, she hardly ever got it. And she was also somebody who, uh, like her neighbors, had a hard physical life. So the 108-year-old gentleman still uh, was working full-time. And for him, this meant 
picking up the mangoes and putting them on his back and carrying them down the mountainside to his canoe. And then canoeing over to the marketplace, and this whole process would take him about a day. Then spending the day at the market to sell his stuff and then canoeing back and doing it over again. So this is hard labor. The guy was skinny as a rail, but muscular and, and bright, uh, cognitively completely intact. And of the 108 year olds I've seen, and I've seen a few, uh, most of the ones in America haven't been quite as bright as this cluster that I got to meet here in Dominica. So, um, so the, the poor Stanford professor said, come on, you know, so, so uh, tell me something that you like to eat that you eat more often. And she said, dumplings. And now the, uh, the, she really wanted to say, so how do you fix your dumplings? And Ma Pompo said, come on, woman, you're in your 50s, you don't know how to fix dumplings? <laughs> so this quip is part of what we geriatricians often use to test cognition in our patients. Being able to think abstractly and have humor is part of saying that you have higher cortical function that can make abstract connections. And you can do this in a non-obtrusive way, in a way that's often pleasant for patients. So this is as a first sign that she's cognitively attacked without having to do other formal testing saying that things are like this. Now, if it's the same joke day in and day out, that's a little bit, again, abnormal because it means they don't have a repertoire. But if they can come along with you as you crack jokes with them and, and uh, sort of do dry humor, if they can participate in that, that usually means there's a little bit more going on. So um, there's Mal um, up close. And she was bedbound here mostly because she had a leg amputated. And that's sort of aside from the point. Uh, the person, the, the woman that was with her was her sitter. Uh, to help her get about. So uh, as we get older, our brain shrinks, and that's no different from Mount Pompo. She also had a brain that had shrunken from atrophy that occurs normally with aging. And uh, much of this is from glial cell loss. Uh, many uh, brain regions have are protected from this cell loss, and you can see regional differences. So some of the areas where we lose cells a little faster, for example, are the hippocampus, the substantia nigra, uh, locus ruleus, large neurons of the prefrontal cortex, and most of the rest of the brain is relatively spared. Now, when you think about the hippocampus, um, you can think about just memory issues. And when you think about the substantia nigra, you can think about the shortened stride length and the sort of things you think of with Parkinson's. So you get a little bit of those things just as uh, the gait changes with normal aging without having to have it be Parkinson's or uh, Parkinson's syndrome. So here's two brains, and one is a normal brain, and the other one is a brain of the same age from an Alzheimer's patient. And you can see that when they become, when they get Alzheimer's disease, the atrophy is much more profound and progresses along in a much faster clip. If you did a specific MRI to look at regions of the brain, you could see that certain areas that, that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, in fact, shrink faster. So this is the patient that Alzheimer's uh, got his uh, reputation from and got his, got his name uh, attached to a disease. Um, that she was 51, so she had a pre-senile form of dementia. Uh, best to be, this was in 1902. Uh, when we think about the dementia incidence, uh, over the age of 65, about 10% of the population has uh, dementia. And over uh, 85, uh, probably about a third of the population. In nursing homes, it's typically more than half. Uh, when we think about our patients that arrive at Hannah House, I would say it's over half, and those really aren't nursing home patients. Those are patients that, for the most part, are destined to go home. So the prevalence of patients who require skilled rehab, in fact, is more likely to have dementia than those that can go straight home and just get home health or lesser care. So before developing dementia, most individuals usually have years and years of cognitive impairment, and most often it is mixed. So when we see patients in our clinic, uh, in our academic medical clinics, we miss the majority of patients that have cognitive impairment, and we even miss people who have frank dementia without recognizing that we've missed it. And uh, when you do this as a formal study, in one academic center, they, they missed uh, over half of them. So there's some things that you should know when you're trying to decide, is it dementia or is this normal aging? What happens normally with aging? So one of the things that you can think about is the difference between crystallized and fluid intelligence. So uh, fluid intelligence is, is what goes down with age, and this is uh, what I would call problem solving of unique things, things you haven't had to solve before. The speed at which we can take a novel problem and solve it goes down. Somewhere in our 20s or 30s, it starts getting slower and slower. 
Now, the speed with which we can do things that rely on all the things we've learned, so it's not completely novel, we get faster as we get older, and that's crystallized in, in intelligence. That looks like this. So uh, vocabulary, by the time any of us in this room get to be into our 70s or 80s, we'll have a vocabulary that's uh, somewhere between 20 and 60,000 words, and probably higher end if we stay academically active, and the lower end if we uh, do not. Um, so for fluid intelligence, uh, it does appear to climb with age. There's also a specific, what we call a terminal drop with fluid intelligence. So in the two years before you die, your ability to problem solve typically goes down. And so when you do these as cross-sectional studies, uh, some of that decline that you see in this curve is related to the terminal drop of happening with people when they come in contact with the, uh, the medical folks. And this is in a couple of years before they uh, actually die. So it's probably not quite as steep as this curve suggests. So uh, it turns out also uh, fluid intelligence is something that you can improve with training and education. And this, this includes in late life, even after you're demented, you can improve uh, the, uh, your performance in fluid intelligence. So you can raise your position on the curve. We'll talk about that later in the talk. So uh, with crystallized intelligence, it improves with age. Performance on practical tasks improves with age until late adulthood, and again, there's a terminal drop associated with that. Uh, but in general, individuals in their 70s are as capable as those in their 20s, and so uh, for people that are as old as I am, it's, uh, you know, all hope is not yet lost. So, uh, in general, if you think about this as functional intelligence, it seems that intelligence declines some with age, Reasoning declines on cross-section studies, but much of that is explained by terminal drop. It does improve until late 60s in longitudinal studies. Fluid intelligence declines with, uh, and crystallized intelligence improves. And job performance maintains or improves in most cases as you get older, even into your 80s. Okay? Now, if you become demented, then all bets are off because this is no longer true. So this is presuming uh, that you don't have diseases that participate in cognitive impairment, or medications that do that. So what is cognitive impairment? It's a characteristic that results from a barrier to the cognition process. If it's global, we typically think of it as, as dementia in late life, as developmental delay in early life, or something specific like an amnestic syndrome or dyslexia. So uh, an example of an amnestic syndrome, uh, I'll give you an example of a patient that I saw. This was a uh, Green Bay Packer that played for Vince Lombardi. And when I uh, met him for the first time in memory clinic, uh, he had uh, a dense amnesia, which, which means he wasn't able to capture new information. So I could uh, say, we're going to do a little experiment here, and I'm going to say, I'm going to take your watch, and I'm going to hide it in the drawer, and in a little while I'm going to ask you where I put it, or where your watch is. And I would wait five minutes, and I would ask him, and he'd have no idea. But at the same time, this guy could still safely drive a car. In fact, uh, when I was uh, seeing him, I was in Virginia, and he was making uh, trips back to Green Bay, where he was the driver and his trophy wife was the navigator. Okay? So he was able to do all the things, drive, drive safely, anticipate, and so forth. All of these things he was able to, he, he could still even fill out checks if somebody told him what he needed to write down. He just didn't have any memory. So he could, he had functional, he could do math, but he couldn't remember what was happening five minutes ago or three or four minutes ago. One or two minutes ago was fine, but five or ten minutes was supposed to. So that's a pure amnestic syndrome. Uh, we allowed him to drive. With that, when I saw him the first time, his mini mental was 24. So that would be Mocha, that's also roughly 24. By the time I saw him the last time, his mini mental had dropped down to 18, and he was still safely driving at that time. And that was almost four years later. He said in his typical uh, Lombardi days, so this would have been in the 60s and early 70s, in the typical football game he would be knocked unconscious three or four times for five to ten seconds at a pop, so he had this recurrent traumatic brain injury that was responsible for his amnestic syndrome, and the other pro football players I've seen have had similar things to that, typically a pure amnestic syndrome and not much else. So, uh, there are different patterns in age, uh, two trends, two patterns, a constant decrease in measures of processing abilities such as reasoning, and stability followed by a steady decline for knowledge previously acquired so that you can't gain but you hold steady state. 
So how do we miss cognitive impairment? And the most common reason we miss it is because we didn't bother looking. So if you think about, if you have an inpatient service now, and you think about your patient population that's over the age of 70, what proportion of those patients are demented? Would have a point of dementia. So in an internal medicine service, that number should be 30% or better, maybe even 50%. If you ask what proportion has cognitive impairment, my guess is it's even higher, probably 60 or 70%. So uh, if that's not the number you have for your service and you have an adult inpatient service, think about the proportion that are over the age of 70, my guess is you didn't look hard enough. Okay. So the question is, is how could you have missed it and how come they look so good when you talk to them? So uh, the documented detection failure rates of 80% occur with mild dementia. Uh, with severe dementia, you can probably figure it out because they can't answer any questions in a reasonable way. But with mild dementia, you miss it. And if you think about your patients that you see that get re-hospitalized in 30 days, uh, you may think that they were non-compliant, but it might be they were just non-adherent because the discharge instructions that you thought they understood as you were explaining it to them or somebody else was were in fact things they couldn't remember, couldn't possibly remember because of their underlying cognitive impairment that you missed. So how you manage those discharges is important and if you don't look for cognitive impairment you will miss the opportunity for a safer discharge home. So so in the screen, so recognizing that you have an underlying dementia prevalence just by the fact of being healthy in 65, up 10 to 15 percent. Uh, 75 to 80 year olds primary caregivers care screening should uh, yield about 25 percent for all just in that age bracket. And you should probably also pre-screen them pre, uh, uh, preoperatively. So I know that our colleagues, our surgical colleagues, uh, are getting consent often on patients who have cognitive impairment. Sometimes when they are abundant, they get signed consent. And I suspect that they haven't adequately assessed their ability to sign consent when they do this. We've witnessed some of these at Hannah House just in the last uh, week. So uh, recognize that uh, pre-op uh, consenting implies that they in fact understand what they're sign signing and can understand what the implications are. But if you haven't asked anything that tells you about their cognitive ability to understand what they're going through, that you probably haven't quite done the patient or their family justice. So um, a clue that you have that there might be cognitive impairment, think about this when you admit a patient, is have they changed um, their activities at home in terms of how they manage the things that require cognition? <laughs> so in geriatrics, we divide these into ADLs and IADLs. ADLs are activities of daily living. That would be things like uh, uh, dressing, bathing, transferring, toileting, eating. IADLs are the activities of daily living that are instrumental, which means they require cognition. So requiring cognition is a balancing a checkbook, using public transportation, keeping their appointment, playing games, recreational activities, including things like tennis or chess or cards, uh, being able to shop at the grocery store, doing your laundry, okay, cooking a meal. So if their ability to do these things, any of these things, has been diminishing, somebody else has taken over, your suspicion that they have underlying cognitive impairment should be peaked. And also, their ability to adhere to discharge instructions, remember this is in fine print, and 20 or 30 pages is a packet they get on the way home, uh, is going to be at risk. Likewise, if you're prescribing medications for them as they head out the door, are they going to be able to adhere to that medication prescription? Can they even understand take this medicine twice a day, or at bedtime, can we understand what that simple instruction means? When we asked that question of an inpatient population, this is something we published last January, Medicare fee-for-service patients, 221 consecutive patients, 40% could not interpret take two at bedtime. So that means that the stuff that we think is pretty obvious and easy is stuff that often our patients can't do, and if you haven't thought about the question of whether they can adhere, it begins with, do they understand? So we do not typically assess whether our patients understand. We assess whether they have heard what you've said, not whether that actually can translate into action. So we need this with institutional provider physicians, and we need to do this in this establishing decisional capacity. And a fair number of the consults we get is with assistance of, do they have capacity to participate in 
deciding where they're going to live next is, is a common question we get. But you might also say about picking a power of attorney. You can have decisional capacity for one, like choosing a power of attorney, and not for the other, like deciding you're going to have a ca uh, cabbage or something like that. So it can vary depending on what the topic is as to what they can understand and respond to. So, uh, what is it okay to forget? Well, we all make memory and other kind of errors, and some of us are at baseline scatterbrained. I would count myself in that group. And typically, the sort, the, the, those of us who are scatterbrained are also folks that are multitasking. In, in fact, when we multitask, we are less efficient or more error prone. You'll also notice that as you get fatigued, your brain doesn't work as well. And one of the things that shows up is you, you develop a mild uh, dysnomia, a trouble with word finding, specifically nouns. When you're at your peak, uh, you have less of that. So your word finding issues should be less in the morning than in the evening when you've had a long day, six or seven hours after your last cup of coffee, for example. So, uh, so really an important part of this is pattern recognition. If the cognitive lapse is new, in a new pattern or frequency, then there is likely a new underlying explanation, and that explanation doesn't have to be dementia. But there should be something to explain it. And that could be anything from stress or sleep deprivation to uh, a medication you're taking. In the winter time, the medication might be, for example, a decongestant, an antihistamine, that can impair uh, memory and cognition. Or it could be more sinister, uh, dementia, hypothyroidism, uh, uh, small strokes, you know, multi-infarct kinds of things, things like that. So when you look at people who have risk for dementia, you can predict who it is going to be, for example, among your diabetics. If you take this 14 category score for folks with diabetes, the people that have 5% in the lowest score um, versus 73% uh, in the highest score have a 10-year risk of dementia, 73% 10-year risk of dementia if you're scoring in the, uh, in the highest group, you have the most deficits. So you can predict uh, over the next 10 years who's going to have issues. And if they're already um, you know, in their 60s or 70s, uh, they probably already have some of that kind of impairment. So how do you pick this up? Can you do this on the fly, or do you have to send that sit down and spend an hour or two with the patients? And the answer is, for the most part, you can figure out who's at risk on the fly. Now, it's useful to do this in a more formal way, but I'm going to talk about the screening steps here to say when should you then go to a more formal assessment and, and how should that be done. So, uh, the kinds of questions are, have you been feeling more scatterbrained lately? That's not intrusive and it allows them to uh, think about this in, in a non-judgmental way. Uh, other words that if you've uh, ever uh, done a consult with me, you'll hear me say, have you been feeling more fuzzy lately? You know, that's really benign, too. And uh, that's particularly true when they're hospitalized. They often feel a little bit more fuzzy. And uh, just the change in environment and so forth makes them a little more confused about the date and the time. And they can lose track of time. If they're three or four days in hospitalization, they're less likely to know the date than the day they arrive unless they're really sick. And then they won't know it either. Um, but then uh, as they become well again, their cognition will improve. And so often, you know, when you, if you get a geriatrics consult, for example, we may have some reluctance to declare them demented if they're very close to their admission. Uh, we have much less reluctance in, in declaring them delirious. And it might take us a couple of days to decide if, the, if they have an underlying dementia that's chronic, even if they have evidence of, of cognitive impairment that was present months or years before. So uh, that's part of that trepidation. Anything big in the news lately? So you should be able to hear from your patients, uh, those that, that at least have some uh, participation in news event, of anything that might be interesting that they could have heard about in the news. So um, if this was today, uh, it could be anything from Obamacare and the web launch, which was a few months ago, to uh, something more recent, like uh, maybe a bridge closing someplace in New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> So these are things that played a lot in the news in the last few days. And so uh, as you ask for this stuff, as you fish for it, that they can capture that is a very good sign and tells you that you have something to work with. If they can't capture any of those things, even though they say they, they listen to the news and participate, it's a little bit more worrisome. In here is also, do you feel sad or depressed? This is a, an article in the Annals published now maybe 15 years ago. 
They used a single question as a screening question for uh, depression. And this has uh, sort of a 60-70% sensitivity and specificity for depression. Not fantastic, which means you'll miss a lot that have depression, but good enough that if it's positive, you should be really suspicious that maybe there's a depression as part of whatever's going on. If they're depressed, you'd forgive them for being a little forgetful because it's entirely possible that fixing their depression will fix their cognitive impairment, something that would be good for adherence to whatever prescription you had in mind. Any fender benders, break out any bills, give up on any games. Did you used to play cards with your friends and not do it anymore? Do you not do your shopping? Does somebody else do your shopping? Who's filling out your bills? Who's, is anybody helping you with keeping your money straight? So those are all sorts of things that are ideal kinds of things that we're now sort of thinking about to say, is there other evidence that we should be looking deeper into this person's cognition? Uh, the things that you're asking would be nice if they were verifiable. So when I'm asking the fender bender question, um, I might ask it of the patient, but I particularly like asking the question when there's a caregiver around that can uh, verify that it hasn't happened because the person may not in fact remember. Often these are things that are happening in the driveway or in the garage, you know, they, they bump something there or parking, and it sounds pretty innocuous, but it's often a sort of a sentinel event for us geriatricians. Consider, even if a screening tool hasn't caught your attention, could you still have missed important cognitive impairment? So if your suspicion is that they did something really stupid, so I had an example um, uh, of a patient who it was actually a couple. Um, I'm one of those docs who's hyperbaric certified. And uh, we had two admissions that came in from a couple that was uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. And the way they had gotten their carbon monoxide poisoning, because they scored really awfully on the carbon testing when I brought them in, was they were grilling indoors with their outdoor grill. So my suspicion was that they had cognitive impairment beforehand, uh, because most people would know better than to light their coals inside their living room. So, um, so again, so thinking about what you missed and so forth and what the baseline was. So, a limited body of evidence suggests that subjective memory complaints, neuropsychiatric symptoms, depression, gait disorders, sleep disturbance, reliably distinguish demented from non-demented patients. And so if you have something like this, they're complaining about this, I think it behooves you to be looking a little further or ask somebody to assist you to look a little further. So the, um, the, the quick tips for screening tools are, uh, you want to have uh, reasonable sensitivity at the expense of specificity. So the more sensitive they are, typically the less the specific they are, but the more likely they are to catch somebody that might have an issue as opposed to just miss them and, and write them off as normal when you had an opportunity to actually intervene. So um, think about who's going to do the screening. If this is an outpatient setting, uh, who, who would do this? Does it have to be the doc or can it be somebody else? So in, um, in the memory clinic that I ran, uh, I had the luxury of having a neuropsychiatrist that usually did the front end cognitive testing. But when we had a, a, a resident or a medical student or a social worker or somebody else without the neuropsychologist, I'd usually allow somebody else to do it. And if none of those were available, I would try to uh, do it for the MA or the nurse that was checking in the, the patient. They often have a, enough downtime that they can be doing it because there's time between the, where they register the patient and put them in. Now, um, if we were doing this on, say, an inpatient unit, should it be the medical team that does it, or should it be somebody on the nursing staff that does it? And I think this is a question about uh, what is your own capability, and can you train them, and what can the system tolerate in terms of this offloading of work? There is value to having the other clinical staff who do day-to-day uh, -day care do it, not just the doc, because in general, if the docs have missed it, the nurses have missed it too. And to bring it to the nurse's attention, or the therapist's attention, if they do the screening, it'll be front and center that they have to do their discharge education in a different way, and they're often the ones that do the discharge education. In the clinic, the same thing is true. It has to do with your workflow. If you have a long line in the waiting room because somebody's slow, uh, that time could be filled by those uh, 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 staff who could be doing some of that screening and just add it to that clinical record. And if they score normally, you'll have a baseline to compare to in the future, and if they're abnormal, it creates perhaps another uh, alternative treatment plan that you can pay attention to. So a single screening test will be impractical for the gen generalist. So I usually like to do a blend of a couple of things, but I like things that only take me a minute or two when I think of this in the office context as, a, as opposed to a consulting context. Uh, and then you want to combine both historical and clinical information to detect the at-risk and demented subjects uh, as, as a triage effort in the office. 
So, when you want to ask about memory complaints in general, and if they don't have any, uh, but they miss uh, memory questions, or the, the thing about anything new in the news lately, you know, uh, who made it to the uh, Super Bowl? Uh, you know, who won the World Series last year? Uh, anything that might be of specific interest to this patient would be, I think, questions that you could ask. Uh, trouble with word finding, especially uh, nouns, and I told you that we all can have trouble with that as we become sleep deprived. Uh, older age, decline in any of the IADLs, uh, thinking of the IADLs as an executive function task, and this should be a trigger to at least do a brief cognitive screen. So then the next thing we do is we think about the onset and course of cognitive functional changes, uh, the pre-existing disabilities and depression specifically, because depression in early life is a risk for dementia in late life. Uh, cultural educational impact on performance, past neurologic history, and I gave you an example of the TBI, the traumatic brain injury, for those Packers uh, and other pro football players. Um, uh, strokes, tumors, infections, so forth, have they had an encephalitis or something like that in the past. Current psychiatric symptoms and life stressors, did they, have a, did they lose their job, did they lose their house, uh, did they uh, lose a spouse? Uh, current medications, and for geriatricians, we love uh, talking about medications because almost always there's medications that have anticholinergic activity that we'd like to get rid of. So when you consult us, expect that as one of the things we'll recommend. Um, and, uh, and alcohol use. Uh, in the VA, I think we catch it more often than we do at the university side because uh, alcohol disorders, I think, are more prevalent in that population. But it's something uh, that should be on your mind also for um, uh, the generic patient. And then family history for dementia and vascular disease. So uh, risk factors for cognitive impairment, uh, if they're early onset, you think about them as being more likely uh, hereditary. Uh, for late onset, they tend to be polygenetic, and uh, there's multimorbidity of aging. There's a confluence of other diseases that collectively can impact cognition. Uh, family history and an environment, head injury, and education turns out to be important too. So here's an example of a way to get cognitive impairment. Um, and these helmets back in 1912 actually weren't that different from the helmets in the 1960s. The big advances came in the early 1970s when they started having hydraulic and other kinds of cushions inside. But even with those, uh, loss of consciousness uh, in this sport is still a relatively frequent thing. So education does matter, and um, one of the studies that really brought this to light was the Nunn study. The Nunn study, uh, the original papers were on a sample of 650, 678 sisters of Notre Dame, and they had agreed to undergo annual evaluations, and at the time they arrived at the convent, at the nunnery, they were asked to write, um, and uh, they also agreed to uh, a brain donation, and what they agreed to do uh, was uh, handwritten autobiographies. And they did this, uh, they, this sample was 93 of them who had done it at age 21. So they were all uh, uh, synchronized in age. And what they found that was interesting was the idea density, the average number of ideas expressed in every 10 words, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, or prepositional phrases, was uh, related to cognition 50, 60 years later. So here's an example of a low idea density. Um, so this is written at age 21. I was born in Eau Claire, Wisconsin on May 24th, 1913, and was baptized in St. James Church. So this is more like Hemingway and less like Faulkner. Okay? And this would be high idea density. The happiest day of my life, and think of this as a run-on sentence, but lots of ideas and prepositional phrases. So far was my first communion day, which was in June 1920, when I was about eight years of age, and four years later in the same month, I was confirmed by Bishop D.D. McGavick. So that's lots of ideas. And um, so it turns out that the ones that had this very high idea density, uh, almost all of them were cognitively intact into their 80s. But the ones that had low idea density, the prevalence of dementia was in the 70% range. A huge difference. And it created a whole other discussion about, can you educate people to prevent dementia? Can you do this through educational intervention? <coughs> So here's PET scans. Uh, these are uh, a 20-year-old and an 80-year-old brain. And what you should be seeing here is that these two brains look essentially identical in terms of hotspots. So you don't have to become demented like Ma Pompo. You can be stay cognitively intact uh, until late life. 
And uh, this is the place where you see words. So if you get a dysnomia, this is a place that doesn't light up as much. But in general, when people have dementia like Alzheimer's disease, it's the whole brain that gets cold. So you can see here a scan of uh, a normal brain at 80 and a dementia, Alzheimer's dementia brain at 80. And in this particular brain, the mini mental status was about nine. So you can see there's a huge difference. And uh, the PET scans start uh, even before cognition begins to be measurably effective. The, the values in the PET scans begin changing. So you can measure it relatively early in PET scans that something's going on. So for a brief cognitive screen, when you do this and you're suspicious, then I would say uh, you probably want to rescreen them in, uh, in a year or maybe even in six months. If the screen suggests mild cognitive impairment, uh, does it, do you believe it? Do you think they're impaired or do you think this is just, you know, because there's false positives too. Is there other stuff going on in this person's life? And so uh, if the clinical interview supports the concern, then you want to work up for the common causes. And if not, uh, you might want to just send them for full neuropsychologic testing so you get a good panel and a good snapshot of the rest of cognition rather than just what your screen picked up. So if it's uh, abnormal, the goal is to evaluate for common causes. So when I think about the kinds of, uh, you know, there's more tests out there than just this, but this is a nice sort of sampling of the kinds of uh, office screening tests that are available. And the way that I've uh, listed them here is from the ones that take the longest to the ones that uh, take the least amount of time. And uh, uh, I think in our neighborhood here at, uh, at Case Medical Center, the three tests that I see used most often are the MOCA, slums, and mini mental. And I think our neuro neurology colleagues uh, tend to lean toward the MOCA. Now, the, the, my favorite of those uh, tests that take about 10 or 15 minutes to do uh, is, in fact, the slums over the MOCA. And, what I, and I'll show you an example of the slums and why I like it. But if I'm in a hurry, I'll use the mini mental because I have it memorized. And if I'm in a real hurry, I'll use one of the tests at the bottom, and, and I'll show you some of those too. So um, slums is St. Louis University mental status exam. And what the slums and the MOCA have over the mini mental is that they're more, sen more sensitive for mild cognitive impairment. So uh, the, the MMSE is a blunter tool. They have to be somewhat impaired to be abnormal. And the MMSE also has a problem in that it's heavily weighted toward memory. And for somebody to be demented, they need to have more than a memory problem. So that gentleman that I talked about with a pure amnestic syndrome wasn't demented. He was just forgetful. Okay? It was a pure amnestic. All of his executive function still worked, but it was clouded because he couldn't remember what happened five minutes ago. So the trails A and B testing are um, uh, somewhat more sensitive, but they're not as specific because you're only testing one function. It's a sequencing function. The mini cog, um, I'll show you an example of that, is uh, remember three things, draw a clock, remember three things. And then it's a question if you forget more than one and had, uh, if you forget two, you're abnormal. If you have an abnormal clock and forget just one, you become abnormal. So that's, it's uh, very fast, you can do it in just a couple minutes. The clock drawing test, so this is just be a clock, um, takes one to five minutes also, and it requires uh, no prep, and you can do it in any language. And we'll go through that exercise and I'll show you a bunch of clocks so that you can see, just visualize without having to know how to score it, how you can use it. Then there's a time and change uh, test. So you put certain coins in a person's hand and just say, uh, uh, I want you to give me 23 cents back and then you see what they come up with and see if they can do it. Um, the functional assessment questionnaire I like because it's a geriatric thing about what can they do for themselves. So as a geriatrician, that one is very pleasing to me. I, um, I often do this uh, sort of subjectively rather than formally, but it's something that's used in a lot of places. And then the last one is walking while talking. Now I'm going to talk about that a little bit more at the end because it also speaks to an intervention that relates to this test. Okay, so here's the slums. And um, so think about the answers to these questions. I'll just read through the questions real quickly. Um, uh, what day of the week is it? Uh, what is the year? What state are we in? Uh, please remember these five objects. Uh, um, and the objects are apple, pea, uh, Thai, house, car. Uh, you have 100 bucks and you go to the store and buy a, a dozen apples for $3 and a tricycle for 20 How much did you spend and how much do you have left? 
And then as you work your way down, um, it has a look at the shapes and pick out the biggest one and uh, 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 mark the triangle. And then this story, and I, I want you to listen to the story, and I'll read it to you, and then I'll ask you questions about it, just see if you know the answer. Okay, it's, um, Jill was a very successful stockbroker. Uh, she made a lot of money in the stock market. She then met Jack, a devastatingly handsome man. She married him and had three children. They lived in Chicago. She then stepped, uh, stopped work and stayed at home to bring up her children. When they were teenagers, she went back to work. She and Jack lived happily ever after. So now the questions are, what is the female's name? You can say it if you know it. Jill. Uh, when did she go back to work? Yeah, when the kids were teenagers. What work did she do? Stock over. And what state did she live in? So, exactly. <laughs> So this is, again, that was a slightly harder question because it didn't say Illinois, right? So the answer was in Chicago. And again, this is, it, it catches folks. And these tests are forgiving in that they allow you to miss a couple of points, so you're welcome. Um, but, uh, you know, if you get a perfect score, you know that there isn't going to be much going wrong here. So you can see as you sum this together, it's, it's actually robust in that it's working memory. There's functional aspects to this. It still doesn't tell you about whether they can make a, a sandwich, but I can tell you how to do this. So um, here you can uh, register three items, draw a clock, and set the hands at 45 minutes past 10. So I'm going to ask you to do this, OK? So uh, um, the, th the three words I want you to remember is, uh, uh, I have to think about this one second. Uh, uh, because I wrote this a long time ago. So uh, the three words I want you to remember is apple, kitten, sofa. And now I want you to draw a picture of a clock on your hand and set, put in all the numbers and set the hands at 45 minutes past 10. So this is the, guy, the, the goal here is to draw that clock. 45 minutes past 10 and do it on your hand with your finger if you don't have a pen. And I like asking afterwards anybody who looks at this clock, would they uh, be able to read the time as... as uh, quarter of 11 or 45 past 10. And if you can't, you get to redraw it. And then I ask, or I write down the three items I ask to remember. And then hopefully you got these three items. I would have gotten it wrong. <laughs> and this is sort of, sort of recognizing three as a threshold number of things to remember. And so I'm going to give you this as an example for why it's important. <coughs> Tell you, it's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, uh, uh, what's the third one there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, five, okay. So, commerce, education, and uh, the uh, um, uh, EPA. There <laughs> so, you may not recall, but that ended his presidential campaign. <laughs> And uh, so the scoring for this, uh, the mini cog, is if they recall none of them, they're demented. If the clock is abnormal, and they miss either one or two, they're demented. If the clock is normal, they're normal, uh, unless they don't recall any. And if they recall all three, they're fine, even if the clock is abnormal. So uh, the FAQ is functional rather than cognitive. It's, it's uh, comparable to the MMSE in terms of scoring. Uh, it's a four-week look back for function. Uh, so they, uh, and ultimately what you're asking about, are they normal, uh, not normal, but independent, or they need some assistance, or are they uh, dependent? And uh, for IDLs, this is now checks, bills, checkbook, taxes, business fair shopping, uh, a loan for groceries, um, taking care of their house, playing a game skill, coffee, heating, water, meal prep, tracking events, and so forth. Those are all the IDLs that we look for. So this is the trails test, and this is also pretty fast because you're asking them, they do a sample where they just have to do five to practice and say this is how it's supposed to work. And then you give them the real test, and this is trails that you test A on the left, which is just simple number sequencing. So you put their pencil on one where it starts and say just uh, draw one, two, three, four, all the way up to 25, connecting them in order, and then you time it. And the second one is trails B, and there it's a little harder because you're sequencing numbers and letters. So it's 1A, 2B, 3C. 
and both of them are very sensitive, but they're, um, the issue is, is they'll get false positive. Some people are slow for other reasons. So there's uh, places where you can get uh, cognitive assessment and functional support, which was that. So the clock drawing test, we're going to do this uh, one more time, and this time it's to teach you how to do it with your patients. So one more time, with your hand and a finger, the instruction goes, uh, draw me the face of a clock. I like using 20 after 8. Lots of folks use 10 after 11. 20 minutes past 8. Put in all the numbers and set the hands at 20 past 8. And then while they do this, I repeat it over and over again until they are finished because this is not a memory test. This is an executive function test. So this is 20 past 8. <coughs> Put in all the numbers and set the hands at 20 past 8. So when you're finished, then you get to this. And this is the instruction we, get, we gave to a whole bunch of folks that had uh, valid driver's licenses. And this is the first of a series I'm going to show you. So when you look at this, is this normal? So in this case, the instruction was 10 after 11. And that's the, when we did this study, that's actually how we did it. So for yourself, what we expect you to do is most of you will do 12, 6, 9, and 3, and then 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8, uh, 10, 11. Then you'll put in the hour hand, and then you'll put in the minute hand. As you fatigue, those planning steps of 12, 6, 9, 3 uh, fade. It becomes 12, 6, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, 11. And even worse, 12, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 9, 8, 10, 11. And even worse, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, 8, 10, 11, 12. Okay, and then the hour hand and the minute hand. And then typically you'll go back and you'll tap your, finger, your pencil on the page to say, cut the hour hand right as you check, and you're done. So the process that you go through as it fatigues, the executive function planning tasks disappear. And as you get sloppier, one of the things that happen is, is you end up leaving more and more space, typically in the upper left-hand quadrant. So in this case, uh, he put in the 12 and 6 first, and you can see he did 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and didn't do the spacing right, and 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But not a bad clock. You can read the time correctly. We did a mini mental and trails testing and other kinds and scored his clock. And when we put him in a driving simulator, he, he essentially was fine. He was straddling the lanes. There wasn't any traffic, so it wasn't a big deal. But we put all of these people with active driver's licenses into a simulator. It's a published paper we published about seven years ago. So is this normal? 10 after 11. You can see the dot by the 11, right? OK. Uh, the numbers are peeled off of one side, so you wonder if there's a little left-sided neglect. You can see the spacing issues. He also did 12, 6. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You can see it because of the spacing. And you can see that when, when you get a clock that I call an OMG clock, oh my god, <laughs> when they have that, you should know that you have with 96% specificity evidence that they cannot drive safely. Okay? So if you have an OMG clock, you don't have to know how to score it. The scoring is OMG. <laughs> Uh, you should be thinking about whether they should still be driving and suggest that they formally get tested. That's either going to the DMV for a driving test or going to an occupational therapist. Doesn't mean they'll never drive again. It means that they're probably at risk. So this guy, when we put him in the simulator, was driving in the oncoming lane on two occasions, turning from the oncoming lane, running red lights, failing to turn. Okay, next one. Not quite normal. Not bad, but not quite normal. Okay, and... Um, uh, he couldn't do trail speed, too sensitive, but he did okay except for the, the minute hand was, was uh, he messed up on it. You can't tell which one is the minute hand. So uh, this guy here, this was his first visit, and we said, this isn't quite normal. We want to see you back in three months because of that concern. And this is three months later. <coughs> and you can see his many mental went from 21 to 17, and he refused to continue his driving simulation after two minutes of practice. We always give him a practice session first. So this is an OMG clock. This was not. This is no driving. OK. You can see, because I had to magnify it here, the, the, uh, it's a tiny little clock. Uh, and you can see he had problems up there between the 10 and the 12. And he couldn't do trails B. His mini mental was fantastic, 28. Uh, we did a mocha on him also. It was 27. OK. But the clock would make you worry. Drove in the wrong lane six times, turned from the wrong lane three times. Okay, had a speeding ticket. Uh, we say you can draw the clock again. If you, if you don't think that somebody can read the time, try it again. We like doing this as part of the exercise because when they do the exercise, if they improve, that's a really good sign. If they can recognize the mistakes they make as they make them and improve upon them, 
these are the folks that can probably still live alone even if they shouldn't be driving. They can still figure out, maybe it'll take them three trips to get the stuff they need to make a PB&J. They can still figure it out. They can do it. They just have to be allowed to do tasks where they can take all the time they want. Driving is not one of those tasks, right? You have to make spot decisions and you have to rely on that. So you couldn't comprehend the driving simulation, but you can see on the first clock, he put the numbers on the outside, so that's a little bizarre. I've done over a thousand medical students, and we've only had one medical student put them on the outside. <laughs> um, I'm thinking he might be a dermatologist now. Um, so the uh, minutes after 11 is the, uh, he wrote in, that's an error of intrusion. And you can see on the first one, he more or less got the hands right. He's, he wrong sized them, right? He put the short, he flipped them. The second one, he got them in about the right spot, but he was improving, I think, some because he was planning because he recognized he didn't leave enough space for all his numbers. So there's some improvement, and that to me is somewhat encouraging. Okay, I have to confess, in this clock, the gentleman drew the 10 after he drew the 11. So he did write a time with 10 after 11. But that was a little concrete for me. Um, his mini metal is 22, and you can see that with this clock, which is clearly a moment, you can also see he was turning the pages he was writing. That's also a moment. So uh, uh, outside of the speed limit range by more than 50 miles per hour, th uh, three times too slow, one time too fast, and the oncoming lane twice, um, so forth. So this clock, not bad. I kind of like the hands going all the way to the center. Okay, but uh, he has an error of intrusion, he wrote 11, 10 on the page. He did 12 and six and did the other stuff, but he was still able to space them roughly okay. So not bad, and he, he could do both the trails testing. Mini mental of 23. So this is a perseverative error. And when we asked them to do this over and over again, they would keep drawing in the lines and said, uh, do you know what you're doing? And says, well, I'm trying to put in the numbers. But they couldn't stop doing it. So this is the same person when they come up to the stop sign, they add gas rather than removing their foot because they can't undo the task they're currently doing. They're perseverative with their foot. So uh, don't want them driving. Uh, first, second, third, fourth try, and you can see it got better and better. So this person can live safely independently but shouldn't be driving. And so uh, this is sort of the, the, the video that comes at the end of drawing clocks because it's about clocks. Excuse me, good morning. Do you know what time it is? 10 past 10. Should have been 11, right? But no Are you sure? Just like I said. Thanks. You're welcome. See, geriatrics, you can still ride a motorcycle. The Pope got a motorcycle. Did you guys hear about that? He's got his own highway. Hey, great day today, eh? No. Yeah? Tell me. What time is it? What again? 7.15. Damn, it's exactly How the hell do you know something? Just by touching the donkey's balls. Okay, so you guys know about the screening test. I don't have to tell you about that. And so this is the last item that I want to tell you about. This is walking while talking. And what you should see on the left-hand side is when this is now sort of dual tasking. Two things you're doing at once, chewing gum and walking. The bottom one is uh, walking without doing a, a second task, and the top one is uh, it takes you longer uh, as you have a second task. And if you have mild cognitive impairment or dementia, the time it takes you to, to walk takes longer and longer as you're doing the second task. Now, the example could be um, uh, the, the way this is done formally is, is there's somebody that's throwing you a ball and you're catching it and you're throwing it back. And so do you have to slow down to do that, or do you, can you keep your pace? But you can also do it with something else. And what I like to do is, because I don't carry a ball around with me a lot, <laughs> uh, is uh, I'll do uh, letter sequencing. So I'll say, uh, I want you to, to walk with me. And now as we walk, um, and I let them stay a little ahead of me, I'm, I'm going to say right behind you. And you tell me the alphabet, every other letter. Start with A. And you can try doing this in your head and see how fast you can go through it. And you can also have them do it in reverse, which is even harder, or you can do it every third letter. So as you do this, uh, pay attention to how much they slow down. If they slow down by more than a third, 
uh, most likely they're demented. Okay? So that's the walking while talking. And even cooler is, um, is that when you do this, you can use this as a training task. If you teach somebody how to do this, so you're, you're walking with them and you're playing catch, they can learn this. They can get better at it. And if they get better at it with tossing a ball, they actually get better at it with doing the alphabet and vice versa. So these are people who are demented that can still be trained to have functional uh, activity. So the second thing is, um, uh, that means that you might be able to change their overall cognitive function, and that's still a work that's in progress. And you might also be able to prevent dementia in the first place by changing lifestyles. So Ma Popple's lifestyle and our lifestyle is different. She didn't have McDonald's. Um, and so one of the questions with the statins and other kinds of things is what else can we do in our diet and with exercise? And there's evidence that exercise by itself may prevent dementia. We can use medications to treat dementia. The cholinesterase inhibitors help primarily with memory, not so much with function. Lumentine, in my experience, is more with executive function and less with memory. So we like using the two together, not one without the other. And there's some evidence that when you use these medications, the cost of care goes down, both in the nursing home and at home. It's less burdensome, less hours of care. So there's a whole bunch of controversial therapies out there, macrolides, exercise of various types, and so forth. If you download Lumosity as a free app, you can have an example of cognitive tasks, and you can train people to do those tasks better, and they function better in other activities, too. So um, games. Uh, dual task training, which is what I was just talking about, uh, seems more durable than motor and cognitive tasks are mixed. Uh, mental arithmetic or while throwing interventions to reduce falls risk have otherwise produced mixed results in cognitively impaired indi individuals, which is why it's cool specifically the walking while talking. They can do cognitive tasks while swimming or doing other exercises too. And heart healthy diet, avoiding alcohol, Ma Pompos diet. And uh, driving and home safety, there's places where they have resources to test these things and uh, think about those as specific uh, places to go for occupational therapy and use common sense. Thank you. I want to thank you so much. That was fantastic. And this is two grand rounds in one year. And I think you come back for a third grand round to cover the last few slides about treatment and prevention. So um, I don't think we have time for questions, but I'm sure Dr. Brown is going to take questions. I had a question. I actually slipped my mind. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you.